Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Armstrong Fomjem. I'm working with the, uh, M, the Mining and Construction of Intelligence of Software Laboratory at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. So I want to look on the onboarding experience, how that actually plays a major role in ecosystem health. So to begin with, we we'll try to look at the software ecosystem from the natural ecosystem perspective to see how much we could learn from in order to impact our Eco, uh, software ecosystem. So we look at the definition or the description of soft of uh, natural ecology. We saw that there are three keywords which truly relate to software ecosystem, and those words are the interaction of organisms and their environment. So if we look at in the pictures on the board, we see that in the natural e ecosystem there are several kinds of organisms that are interacting without, within the environment. And if we go further now, we see, for example, there is an organism there that is circle, like the, uh, the fungi. It has to live on a rotten wood. And those uh, circle forms a habitat, like a home, for that fungi to survive. And that, for, that rotten wood cannot exist if a tree is not fallen. So you see that it builds a community which is like the level of a software project. But that project is only a subset of all the projects that belong to an ecosystem and projects are different. So what is this organism? Is that physio, physio, uh, biological adaptation and the interaction with the environment? How does that physical structure of that organism interact with the environment? It's very important for us to know how to, to build uh, an ecosystem. Moreover, we realize that in the natural ecosystem, there is this word of biodiversity. A lot of people, especially the pre previous speaker, spoke about diversity. We know the importance of diversity in software ecosystem or software project level. We need projects to be different skills and people to be different, demographical, cultural, and all sorts of diversity is highly welcome because it enriched the project or an ecosystem. But we also realize that in the natural ecosystem, there is this concept of key organism. As we will see later, when we take the natural ecosystem, we can copy paste the concept into a software ecosystem that really fits, and those other concepts that we have in the natural ecosystem can help to boost the software ecosystem. So when we talk about uh, the software ecosystem, it is built on by people who are enthusiastic, people who, are, who, have, who have the self-driven uh, determination. They are either volunteers or they are hired by companies to work on a project. But when you look at an individual person, which happens to be an organism in this case, there are other, sub, there are other categories of organisms which we mention here as a keystone organism. Remember that we borrow this concept also from the natural ecosystem. These are experts or mentors within an ecosystem. They help to train weaker organisms to understand the culture, to understand the working environment, to understand the code base of a software project so that they could effectively contribute. And how does this happen? We, we, come, we came up with this concept of the niche, which we already mentioned earlier. We see that when you take somebody, for example, a particular organism, you need to feed them inside a project team. They need, to be, they need to get some form of adaptation. They need to be adjusted to understand what is happening. That process it, it itself, if it is not well handled, things can even go wrong. And the better way of handling this adaptation, where you fit people into a code base to contribute with other people who have been there, is something that we want to focus on in this uh, talk. This adaptation occurs at every step. We, we investigate three different kinds of niches. So this adaptation, as we said, of course, now this niche is how these organisms interact with themselves and the environment. So we, we realize that during the, a concept where we will call onboarding, most of you already know what is onboarding, we, there is one particular niche, is the Greenhillian niche. It determines by organism's habitat and its behavioral adaptation. Because people are coming with 
prayer knowledge. They may have experience or they are completely uh, not experienced. And how do we adapt them to that project? We also see how other form of niche happens. People, when they come into a project, they need to collaborate. But there is another kind of collaborations that we call it like joint collaboration. When more than one person work on a particular piece of code, because it might be so complex, it might need more time, there may be several reasons why they are doing this joint collaboration. This kind of collaboration exists even in the natural ecosystem, and we have seen evidence in software ecosystem that it is also happening. So we want to investigate this kind of mechanism, how it helps in the health of an ecosystem. So we also notice that when people co collaborate, the end process is either to release and artifacts. So these people need to gain experience as they are collaborating. And at the end, they also have to impact the, the, the software ecosystem or the project they are working with. Now, this comes up, what is actually the health we have been talking about? If we look at from the basic definition of World Health Organization, since we are trying to fit things together, we saw that the, the definition is this state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not just the absence of disease or infirmities. So if we say that a software project is healthy because they don't have bug, which can be a disease, or they don't have toxicity, which can be infirmity in this case, we might not be seeing a complete picture because we might not pay attention to the complete physical, the mental, and well-being. And how does this relate to ecosystem health? So if a, we talk about a, com a, a, a complete physical, that's the project must be, they, they, they must be like independent projects that are well-structured. They have team members that knows what they are doing, that mental capability, the, the technical know-how, and the social interactions that exist between them. These are three components that must exist. Then we can now measure also the, if it is not too much uh, buggy, toxicity, and the community code smells. If those things are well uh, uh, measured, we can now be talking about the software ecosystem and the health of the software ecosystem. But by the way, we realize that for an ecosystem, it is made up of a consortium of interdependent projects, which each of these projects have their own roadmaps. If a particular project is healthy, we cannot assume that the entire ecosystem is healthy. So a project health does not equate to an ecosystem health at that level of ecosystem. But now, how do we really see or describe an ecosystem health from this perspective? We see that if everything, if every project team and every key player is operating properly, we can now say that the entire ecosystem is sound, is healthy. So we did a case study uh, with OpenStack ecosystem, which many of the previous speakers also mentioned and said it is a successful ecosystem. Now, there are three, uh, four, sorry, four categories of technical issues that also people have measured. We just categorize them at that level. To see for the technical level, we have the technical debt, the code smells, bug, and things like that. We, we also categorize all the social uh, uh, dimension. We saw the boss factor, which is an important aspect that uh, we should also consider when we are talking about the project or ecosystem health whereby how the people of, uh, we know we usually talk about uh, abandoning. It's a common phenomenon in most open source projects. But sometimes people don't know how to handle abandoning. When key developers are abandoning the project, they don't know how to retain them. And this particular aspect of lacking to retain key players have caused even so many projects to collapse. So we will look at the elephant factor, which others have already mentioned, the code of conduct and things like that. We form them in different in those four categories. But talking about all these things, we realize that the Kiosk community has already set up a very good baseline whereby we can easily measure all those technical issues to describe the health, not only of a project, but of an ecosystem. So to go into the, the context of our talk today, we try to look at onboarding, how it impacts the health of an ecosystem. But by the way, what is onboarding? Just a definition that the dictionary gives us for onboarding, it says an action or process of integrating new employees into an, ego, or into an organization or familiarizing new customers or clients with the process of, or services. 
But you realize that the symbol of scissors that we were trying to cut out that word action, because based of our observation and understanding that we did, onboarding is actually a process and not an action. We will show that later on why. So with the case of OpenStack ecosystem, which is a well-structured ecosystem, they have this concept of onboarding. And it has been proven to be successful for that ecosystem. How can we now take this experience to generalize it to any other ecosystem? So we realized, we did an observational study. We saw the, the, the diversity of people and skills that are coming for the onboarding training and how they, they, they are training new people to be effective within that ecosystem. So OpenStack actually introduced onboarding in 2014. But before OpenStack itself was created in 2010 from Rackspace and NASA, that we all know. Now, we try to measure the quality of contributors. We, we use effort, the times that they, they took to do their first accepted commit, and many other metrics from 2014 that OpenStack was introduced. We separated two categories of people, like those who did the onboarding and those who did not do it, to see how that impacts if onboarding actually has an impact to the ecosystem health. So based on that, we realized that those who did onboarding, we saw before, oh, sorry, the performance of those before onboarding and who did not do onboarding, there was a great significant difference towards their first commit. Those who did onboarding actually spent a lesser time to, to do their first acceptable commit than those who did not do. They had to do several iterations before it was accepted. Also, the effort, that's the number of attempts over the actual commit. Those who, uh, who did the onboarding has lesser effort, which is good. And moreover, we saw that there was, I'll just try to move. Uh, so can I have a okay, yes, please. Sorry. Which slice is that? The, yeah, the, one the one before this? Oh, sorry, this is the survivor analysis. In this survivor analysis, we are trying to measure a time to an event, a time before an event occur. And the, in the x-axis, is the, the time is measured by the number of days. So we want to see the, num the, the, the number of days in which the contributors actually did their first, con submitted their first patch and it was accepted. So if we see the colors that we use there, we try to separate the, the contributors per the gender diversity. So we look at people where, who, who are like male, female, and the neutral category. We saw how that diversity of the group influences the, like the, their contribution in terms of the effort that we measure and the con commit that they were submitting. So we are, we are trying to look also the diversity in that ecosystem and now to see how each category is performing over time. Now, we always start with the survival analysis, we always start at 100%. It decreases as, as the, the, the number of these increases. So we see that on the y-axis is the percentages that we, we, we keep it like uh, fixed and we try to vary the time. We realize that on average, if we look at 300 days down on the x-axis, we realize that for, the, for those before, the number of contribution is almost at 75%. So very few people have contributed up to that point. But if you take the same number of days, a, a lot of people, it's almost like many people have already submitted their patch and it was accepted. So as time goes on, those who did onboarding had their first acceptable commit faster than those who did not do onboarding. So that is an indication that onboarding helps to build a healthy ecosystem, you know, because we talk about accepted, they have gone through all the code reviews and things before it is accepted. So we cannot measure from here, we cannot start measuring qualities and things like that, but we, say, we look at the effort, like here, where we were measuring the number of attempts that they did over the, uh, the actual commit itself. So the longer it takes, they make more attempts, it means there are things to improve. There are things to improve before it acts, the final acceptance. So if we realize that, the shorter the, the effort, the better and the higher quality it is. 
So those with lower quality describe those with higher quality, uh, with, sorry, those with higher numbers of effort describe those with higher qualities. And we see that in the, the box plot in the right after. So that's the key point that we want, to, the message we want to pass here, that contributors submit successful patches with lesser effort after onboarding. So these were just observations that we did for the, we, we observed during the onboarding training itself. So, oh, sorry, that was fast a lot. So just to come back to, okay. We realized that mentoring, as we saw, was one active, uh, a useful instrument which this onboarding introduced, like in OpenStack, what we observe is that when people come in for the onboarding training, they are also mentored throughout a process. It is not just an event that happened and it is, it is done. They try to follow them up, send reminders, sometimes get one-on-one -on -one communication. We notice that you attempted this. Do you have, do you, uh, have difficulties in completing this kind of follow-up? helps a lot of people, as we observe in our findings later on, to be active within the community and afterward to remain within that community. So this also shows us some indications that onboarding is not just, like on, uh, onboarding is not an event, but a process that follows up people up to an integration. And that can also show indication to reduce abandoning. Because if you understand that you can mentor people, you understand that at some point they are not getting involved anymore, it's already an indication something is wrong, then follow up can take place from there. So to conclude, we introduced this concept of onboarding borrowed from the natural ecosystem, which already is something that human beings can, is already involved and can learn from. We realized that we can copy this concept, we can borrow it from the natural ecosystem to software ecosystem, it fits very well. We also introduced onboarding, which is a tool to measure the software ecosystem health. And we saw that onboarding was actually a process and not an action or, or just an event that happens and it is done. So we introduced some metrics where, which we use to show that uh, OpenStack, for example, is a well diverse and inclusive ecosystem. It has this evolution and the survival of uh, the contributors over time. It has grown to cross-community collaboration where you can see uh, different projects working together to build a healthy ecosystem. And also we show now the survival analysis which shows that those who did onboarding performs better over time than those who did not do. Even though there are a lot of other uh, explanations that can still be given, we have taken care to that and we, we are still doing a studies to, to come up with a bigger conclusion. So for now, this uh, is our result. So questions for our show. Okay. Yes, please. So have you, uh, has, has your group thought about ecosystems in more of an ad hoc way? So like when I think about OpenStack, I think of a fairly uh, structured ecosystem. Yeah. And obviously, there are ecosystems that could be kind of built with, with less structure. Yeah. So have you thought about this at all, you know, the more ad hoc type of structure? Yeah, we actually, before doing the, this study, we consider communities a lot of other communities, for example, Apache Ecosystem, the Eclipse, and many others. But because of the nature of our study, this is just one aspect of it. We needed an ecosystem that is well-structured to begin with because we need to measure the health. We need something that we can measure. So that is one of the reasons eco, like, uh, OpenStack was really a favorable candidate. But we actually look into an extent, Apache and the Eclipse and many others, and realize that some of them were lacking in some other criteria that we needed to be in place. But it would also be a good thing at the end of the day to see if our recommendations and things like that we can propose, where we can actually suggest help to such of those, of those uh, ecosystems. Mm -hmm. If it's in a more informal or ad hoc way, like the concept of uh, kind of providing onboarding support, like where would that 
it just be interesting, like where that would lie. So like if I think of a group like Red Hat or an organization like Red Hat, yeah. and obviously a lot of their projects are part of very large scale ecosystems. Some are probably more formal and some are more informal. Yeah. You know, like how how something like onboarding would be handled in a formal setting. The, the, the point there with a case like Red Hat, which is already uh, an ex established uh, project and is building itself also to an ecosystem, the thing with onboarding here will be when people come in, how do they understand, for example, the ecosystem itself and where can they ca actually contribute? Because new members, when they come into a project, sometimes they need someone to navigate them to show, give a vivid overview of the project. Let alone some of them might discover it, but some can get easily get lost. But that time to discover, onboarding try to f give a focus. So in that context, onboarding will help to give a focus. It's not like giving the answer to the contributor that this is what you should do, but guiding them towards their skills. We have seen cases where also people started in one project because everybody is navigating towards that direction. Only after a period of, say, six months, they say, oh, no, this is not my area of expertise. They had to change. And that waste of time and waste of resources is not something an organization wants to invest money on. So onboarding will help to tell her where your experience is mostly geared to focus on that area and to grow. Yeah. Yes, please. For the case of OpenStack, what uh, I ob we observe personal is that when there is an up, uh, they have what is called an upstream institute, a particular team of experienced people that actually handles onboarding. And this expert comes from core developers from other projects within, the ecosystem, within OpenStack to help the younger people to grow. Because we know there are so many projects within OpenStack. And people coming in, they need to know their way out. So these core developers from other projects come in with their skills to help these new people. So during the onboarding uh, uh, events, these experts, they organize these events. They, come, they are there physically. And these new people are there. Then they start following them up. Even after the two days event is over, they still have a means of communication, of communicating with these people. And to the best of my knowledge, I know if you still go and sign up with any of the IRC channel, ask for help, even if you do not come for the onboarding, and you show some great enthusiastic skills, or like seriousness, there will always be people to help you around. That's something that I've observed with the Ocos, and it's very healthy. Thank you.